Well folks, you're welcome joining us in the new year again uh, from Ryan Newton churches, uh, from Fawn and from Waterside and maybe from some other churches or just folk around uh, the community clicking in. You're very welcome to join us for Wednesday in the Word. Uh, we're going to look at a, a new series in the new year and uh, I thought, I don't know about you, but I'm fed up listening to bad news and dreary news and weary news and I just want some good news and I thought I would just love to look at something very positive, something that lifts us up uh, thinking about who we are and who we are in Jesus. So if you like a little title of that, like that TV programme, Who Do You Think You Are? It is what we're going to look at, looking at a little passage in 1 Peter 2 from verse 9 through to verse 12. Uh, also as you know on Sundays we're starting into a little series looking at the life of Joshua. Uh, so before we pray together, let me actually read the passage to you uh, today from, from 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to read from verse 4, although we're going to concentrate more on verse 9 through to verse 12. But in 1 Peter chapter 2, from verse 4, As you come to him, the living stone rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now, to you who believe this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone and a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you, as aliens and strangers in the world, to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. These are wonderful words and from verse 9 on, over the next lot of weeks, we're just going to mine them and just take time uh, to dig in and see what God can say to us through these wonderful words about who we are in Jesus. But let's pray together, please. Let's bow in prayer. Lord, we gather before you today to turn our heads, our hearts, our minds and our wills towards you. We humbly ask, Lord, that as you walked and talked with the disciples on the Emmaus Road, as you opened and explained your word to them, we ask that by your Spirit, you would do the same with us just now. Cause our hearts, Lord, to burn within us, being, bringing transformation. As you transform their circumstances and situation, Lord, transform ours. You change their despair into delight, their weariness into worship. Their spirits were awakened and encouraged by your presence and by the glorious news of the resurrection. Death is defeated. Sin is conquered. Relationship with the Father can be restored. Lord, we can know our sins forgiven. We can know our adoption into your family, the family of God. And so, Lord, in these moments, now, please remind us of your salvation, freely available to us 
Remind us of the security that we can find when we are found in you. So Lord, lead us in these moments, we pray. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're picking up the little theme. Who do you think you are? Uh, and just this morning, actually, uh, as I was listening to Highland Radio, uh, just uh, there, there was a chap on speaking about the whole mother and baby homes thing that's going on. And he's a, a child that was born uh, out of wedlock. Um, and just as he spoke, it was heartbreaking as he talked about uh, in the last while, actually, his adoptive mother and father had passed away. And then just recently discovering, uh, not ever, ever meeting her, but discovering that his birth mother had passed away. But now knowing that there's a father somewhere and he thinks in Donegal, but he doesn't know. And just wrestling with, with who he is and, and his own identity. And, and just so much, absolutely heartbreaking listening to it. I don't know if you've ever watched the Who Do You Think You Are program. Uh, and it's been interesting, I know, over the last wee while, over the last you know, bundle of years, watching different actors that discover somebody in their past was in the theatre and it just kind of really excites them. Or, or somebody that's connected to royalty, I think possibly was it Alexander Armstrong. Um, but then on the darker side, somebody who's been in prison or family in the past in prison who were a bit of a rogue, I think it was Mark Wright, um, kind of personality, TV personality chap, uh, related to a Spanish swordsman, some great renowned Spanish swordsman. You know, that our identity affects who we are and just, have you ever been in that place too where you kind of just feel worthless? You feel, you know, actually who am I and do I really count? Maybe you, like me in the past, last picked in the playground for playing TIG or playing football or whatever it might be. And the whole thing about your self-worth. Well, when we read these words in First Peter, it's about who we are. And actually, they're packed and stacked full of Old Testament illusion. William Barclay in his little commentary says, The great promises of God made to Israel are being fulfilled to the church, which is the new Israel. As I say, packed and stacked in these verses in Peter are just all of these pictures and illusions and promises that were for God's people in the Old Testament. And through Christ now, Peter is encouraging us that they're for us. You are God's possession. Verse 9, the first part. A chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. Belonging to God. Isn't that wonderful? That's our identity. We belong to God. Who do you think you are? You are God's child. If you know Christ as Saviour, you are in his family. A chosen people. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. And I missed it before looking at these words. But not only belonging to God, but if you look at those words, they're all plural descriptions. A chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Not only do we belong to God, but we belong to each other. That picture of the family of God. The ESV uh, version of the Bible actually translates these words a people for his own possession and again as I say packed and stacked there is just this beautiful allusion to well there's seven passages uh, through the Old Testament from Exodus 19 through to Malachi 3 verse 17 uh, where there's this little phrase used of God's people in the Old Testament and it's being God's treasured possession. Let me read you actually uh, in, in Exodus 19 where God says, How I carried you in eagle's wings and brought you to myself, bringing us out of Egypt. But now if you fully obey me and keep my covenant, 
then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. There in Exodus, towards the start of the, the Old Testament, and right at the end then, in, in Malachi chapter 3, verse 17, they will be mine, says the Lord Almighty, in the day when I make up my treasured possession. And that's looking forward. They will be mine, says the Lord, in the day when I make up my treasured possession. A people for his own possession. But there's more in this. It's from an old Hebrew word called segula. You'd think I was some kind of knowledgeable character, but I just love this. It means owned by royalty. It's the ownership, you see, that gives us our worth. We are owned by royalty. We are God's treasured possession. William Barclay in his commentary unpacks a little bit. He says, if you ever think about ordinary objects, maybe you go to visit a museum and there's a pen, or there's a piece of paper or a notepad, or you watch an antique roadshow and you see some piece that comes in, and it's just something ordinary. But whenever then there's a connection made to its owner, all of a sudden its worth is changed. It's ownership which gives it its worth. I go, I love my music as you maybe know. You go into Hard Rock Cafe and there's guitars or there's drumsticks or there's drums or there's things hanging about the walls in all Hard Rock Cafes. But what makes them important or worth and valuable is that they belonged to some great musician. So here, the first little reminder, we'll unpack this over the next few weeks, but we are God's treasured possession. A chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people who belong to God, but as we say, also belong to each other. The next few verses in here, though, actually contrast what you were and what you are. Not only are we God's possession, but there's this picture here then, in the second part of verse 9, of illumination. That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You see the contrast brought out of darkness into God's wonderful light. Second Corinthians uh, chapter 4 verse 6 says this. For God said, let light shine out of darkness. For, the God, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory that's displayed in the face of Christ. So we are God's possession and God has shone his light in our hearts to bring illumination to us. And again, that picture of contrast, that picture, not only of illumination, but actually in the verse 10, transformation as this follows on. These contrasts, once you were not a people, now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, now you have received mercy. In those two pictures, once you were not a people, now you are the people of God. Who do you think you are? You're the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And this picture gives us adoption in Christ and justification through God's mercy on us. 2 Corinthians 5 verses 17 and 18 words say this. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. But then we often stop that verse there at verse 17. But it goes on to say, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. Who do you think you are? You're God's possession. His segula, owned by royalty. Illumination is brought into our hearts. And darkness is taken away. And that transformation through adoption and through justification. Once you were not a people, but now you're the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. But there's more in this passage. And let's just look at that. So two other things. Verse 11, verse 12. Separation and attraction. Separation. We're... Verse 11 just simply says, Dear friends, 
I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Now I don't know about you, but that's me. Again, that constant wrestle with sin and temptation which wage war against your soul. And I love in this verse, and we'll say we'll unpack it in a few weeks' time, but look at the affection there. Peter writes, dear friends, we're aliens, aliens and strangers in this world. You know, what's the old song? This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. And then abstain. We need to make a choice to abstain from sinful desires, to say no to them. And then against, which, which wage war against our souls. So again, these decisions that we make. But the whole thing here is actually about separation. That who do you think you are? Well, you're God's lighthouse people. Way back in the Old Testament, God's people were to be different in how they lived and behaved. And so that they would stand out in society and people would look and look to them. Not only separation, but then the next verse is about there's an attraction that people then look and ask questions. Our identity, you see, is to be God's lighthouse people in the world. And then verse 12 is about how, now it's not easy, it'll be difficult, but that there's an attraction. Maybe where Paul writes at the start of Second Corinthians about the aroma of Christ in our lives, to some the smell of death, to some the smell of life. Peter writes, live such good lives among the pagans, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. So that idea about living differently, living a holy life in our world, in our community, so that people ask questions. And I say certainly as Paul writes, to some it's the smell of life, to some the smell of death. Here Peter says that people may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. The old church historian Tertullian uh, lived in Carthage in North Africa in the middle of the Roman Empire um, living in pagan days, living in days of poverty and illness and persecution. But there's a famous phrase of his where he writes to see how these Christians love one another. And not just love one another but love those who are in need around them. And that idea that the Christian folk lived so differently that they made an impact on the society around them. When you know who you are in Christ, it will work its way into your life. But when it works its way into your life, it will then work its way out and impact society and community. And that's what we're going to look at over the next lot of weeks who do we think we are? But today, if you're feeling low, know that you're chosen, that you are precious to God. There, there's a beautiful story <coughs> in Mike Eckenelli's book, um, Messy Spirituality, and I've, I've just held it for years. I think it's my most loaned out book, and I actually have three copies of it on my bookshelf at the minute. But he writes of a friend of his called Daniel Taylor. He says, in his marvellous book, Letters to My Children, Daniel Taylor describes an experience he had in the sixth grade in America. Periodically, the students were taught how to dance. Thank goodness this kind of thing isn't done anymore. But the teacher would line up the boys at the door of the classroom and shoot to choose their partners. Imagine what it would have been like to be one of the girls waiting to be chosen, wondering if they were going to be chosen, wondering if they would be chosen by someone they didn't like. One girl, Mary, was always chosen last. Because of a childhood illness, one of her arms was drawn up and she had a bad leg. She wasn't pretty, she wasn't smart, and she was, well, fat. The assistant teacher of Dan's class happened to attend his church. And one day, she pulled Dan aside and said, Dan, next time we have dancing, I want you to choose Mary. Dan couldn't believe it. Why would anyone pick Mary when there was Linda, Shelley, 
or even Doreen. Dan's teacher told him it is what Jesus would have done. And deep inside he knew she was right, which didn't make it any easier. All Dan could hope for was that he, that he would be last in line. That way he could choose Mary, do the right thing, and no one would be the wiser. Instead, <laughs> Dan was first in line. The faces of the girls were turned towards me, some smiling. I looked at Mary and saw that she was only half turned to the back of the room. She knew no one would pick her first. Mr Jenkins said, OK Dan, choose your partner. I remember feeling very far away. I heard my voice say, I choose Mary. Never has reluctant virtue been so rewarded. I still see her face undimmed in my memory. She lifted her head and on her face reddened with pleasure and surprise and embarrassment all at once was the most genuine look of delight and even pride that I have ever seen before or since. It was so pure that I had to look away because I knew that I didn't deserve it. Mary came and took my arm and as we'd been instructed and she walked beside me, bad leg and all, just like a princess. Mary is my age now. I never saw her after that year. I don't know what her life's been like or what she's doing. But I'd like to think that she has a fond memory of at least one day in sixth grade. Because I know I do. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. Who do you think you are? Amen. Part three, Glenn, the last wee bit. So two other things, verse 11, verse 12, separation and attraction. Separation, where verse 11 just simply says, Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Now I don't know about you, but that's me. Again, that constant wrestle with sin and temptation which wage war against your soul. And I love in this verse, and we'll say we'll unpack it in a few weeks' time, but look at the affection there. Peter writes, dear friends, we're aliens, aliens and strangers in this world. You know, what's the old song? This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. And then abstain. We need to make a choice to abstain from sinful desires, to say no to them. And then against, which which wage war against our souls. So again, these decisions that we make. But the whole thing here is actually about separation. That who do you think you are? Well, you're God's lighthouse people. Way back in the Old Testament, God's people were to be different in how they lived and behaved. And so that they would stand out in society and people would look and look to them. Not only separation, but then the next verse is about there's an attraction that people then look and ask questions. Our identity, you see, is to be God's lighthouse people in the world. And then verse 12 is about how, now it's not easy, it'll be difficult, but that there's an attraction. Maybe where Paul writes at the start of 2 Corinthians about the aroma of Christ in our lives, to some the smell of death, to some the smell of life. Peter writes, live such good lives among the pagans, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. So that idea about living differently, living a holy life in our world, in our community, 
so that people ask questions. And I say certainly as Paul writes, to some it's the smell of life, to some the smell of death. Here Peter says that people may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. The old church historian Tertullian uh, lived in Carthage in North Africa in the middle of the Roman Empire, um, living in pagan days, living in days of poverty and illness and persecution. But there's a famous phrase of his where he writes, to see how these Christians love one another. And not just love one another, but love those who are in need around them. And that idea that the Christian folk lived so differently that they made an impact on the society around them. When you know who you are in Christ, it will work its way into your life. But when it works its way into your life, it will then work its way out and impact society and community. And that's what we're going to look at over the next lot of weeks. Who do we think we are? But today, if you're feeling low, know that you're chosen, that you are precious to God. There's a beautiful story <coughs> in Mike Iaconelli's book, um, Messy Spirituality. And I've, I've just held it for years. I think it's my most loaned out book. And I actually have three copies of it on my bookshelf at the minute. But he writes of a friend of his called Daniel Taylor. He says, in his marvellous book, Letters to My Children, Daniel Taylor describes an experience he had in the sixth grade in America. Periodically, the students were taught how to dance. Thank goodness this kind of thing isn't done anymore. But the teacher would line up the boys at the door of the classroom and shoot to choose their partners. Imagine what it would have been like to be one of the girls waiting to be chosen Wondering if they were going to be chosen. Wondering if they would be chosen by someone they didn't like. One girl, Mary, was always chosen last. Because of a childhood illness, one of her arms was drawn up and she had a bad leg. She wasn't pretty. She wasn't smart. And she was, well, fat. The assistant teacher of Dan's class happened to attend his church. And one day she pulled Dan aside and said, Dan, next time we have dancing, I want you to choose Mary. Dan couldn't believe it. Why would anyone pick Mary when there was Linda, Shelley or even Doreen? Dan's teacher told him it is what Jesus would have done. And deep inside, he knew she was right, which didn't make it any easier. All Dan could hope for was that he, that he would be last in line. That way, he could choose Mary, do the right thing, and no one would be the wiser. Instead, <laughs> Dan was first in line. The faces of the girls were turned towards me, some smiling, I looked at Mary and saw that she was only half turned to the back of the room. She knew no one would pick her first. Mr Jenkins said, OK Dan, choose your partner. I remember feeling very far away. I heard my voice say, I choose Mary. Never has reluctant virtue been so rewarded. I still see her face undimmed in my memory. She lifted her head, and on her face, reddened with pleasure and surprise and embarrassment all at once, was the most genuine look of delight and even pride that I have ever seen before or since. It was so pure that I had to look away because I knew that I didn't deserve it. Mary came and took my arm. And as we'd been instructed, and she walked beside me, bad leg and all, just like a princess. Mary is my age now. I never saw her after that year. I don't know what her life's been like or what she's doing. But I'd like to think that she has a fond memory of at least one day in sixth grade 
because I know I do. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. Who do you think you are?